Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We are chatting with Brian London. We're going to be talking market reactions, especially in the resource sector, to the election. Brian is the editor of the Gold Newsletter and our host down at the New Orleans Investment Conference. Coming up in about two weeks' time, November 20th to 23rd, I will post a link to that conference in the show notes. Please, anybody, if you are in town or want to take a quick trip out to New Orleans, I hope to see you there. Please send us a note if you will be in attendance. Brian, let's talk about, again, market reactions, especially in, let's start precious metals, but it was really commodity-wide that we saw a drop on the back of the Trump victory. Now, we are seeing a rebound today. Copper's taking back almost all of its losses. Copper's up over 4%. Gold is up $30, but look, it, it was down almost $100 yesterday, and silver's taking back about $0.56 cents of its loss yesterday, now trading a little below $32 an ounce. Brent, what was your takeaway from that reaction to Trump's victory where it seemed like a lot of sectors were doing well, but the resources, commodities were selling off? Yeah, I think the traders looked for an excuse to short the metals. And once they got it going, they just piled on. Yeah, the idea was that there was some kind of a geopolitical risk premium built into the metals that, you know, if Trump lost, there would be some kind of political strife and riots in the streets and all of that. And so that faded away, obviously. And that was an excuse to just uh, affect a trade, a short trade on the metals and gold in particular and silver. And you know, and over the months preceding the election, a, a lot of my Canadian friends and international friends and media would ask me what effect uh, the election was going to have on gold. And, and my answer was always nothing, because it's th the issues that are have been driving gold are far beyond what any presidential administration can even address right now if they were interested in addressing them, which apparently they're not. And those issues revolve around the U.S. federal debt and the ability to pay that debt and to service that debt. And, and that's what's really been driving gold. And the situation right now with the debt is such that no administration could do anything about it if they were so inclined. But neither campaign even mentioned it uh, during the campaign. So obviously, they're not really concerned about it. And it's too large for them to do anything about it anyway. So obviously, I should have said that there may be some short-term volatility, which there was. But as you say, you know, the markets are already well on the way to re of recovery. And I think those fundamental factors are, you know, getting back into play and driving the markets once again. Well, Brian, just based on the debt discussion, a lot of people were encouraged that Trump may do more to try to reduce the spending, at least make some cuts. He definitely wants to cut taxes, but will he make some cuts on the spending side? But do you think that the debt, like you're saying, it's so big now, it's ballooned up so much and rates yeah. are higher that it's mathematically a no-go? Yeah, it really is. You know, I applaud Elon Musk for wanting to go in and cut bureaucracy. And I think that needs to be done and needs to streamline things and that can really help unleash economic growth. But only about 25% of the federal budget is, non is even discretionary right now. Everything else is on autopilot. And you can throw that if you throw national defense in there as well. So even if they were able to cut half of what of the non-discretionary or of the discretionary spending, rather, that would only affect around 10 percent of the federal budget. And that would be very deep cuts that I think were themselves would be politically impossible. So the situation now is the result of over four decades of ever easier money encouraging ever greater debt accumulation. So there's nothing I think that they can do. We can't raise taxes enough to eliminate the deficit and slow down the increase in the in the debt, debt growth. We can't grow our way out of it. The numbers are too large at this point. We can't cut spending because of the issues I just said, and there's no real political will to get that kind of, those kinds of cuts done. So all we can do at this point is prepare for the consequences. And I think gold is the obvious 
and greatest will prove to be the greatest beneficiary of these trends that I think we're kind of locked into right now. So, Brian, I feel like we've been talking about debt and the skyrocketing debt for years, even a couple decades now, because, look, debt has really skyrocketed when you look at a chart. But balance that out with a lot of people think Trump is going to be able to spur the economy, show some more growth. We saw the reaction in the markets. People seem to be excited about what the markets could do, what the companies could do with Trump being the next president again. Does that overshadow that debt component? And we're stuck four years from now still saying, look, the debt's higher, but the markets have simply outpaced the precious metals. Well, Corey, you're a young guy, relatively, at least to me. And if you're sick of hearing about the debt, imagine me from hearing so many really smart people talk about the debt bomb getting ready to blow up. Many of them across the stage of my conference over four decades and it never happened. So I'm looking at it now with a really a cynical eye and have been had been very cynical toward this issue for many years. But now it's simple math. It's inescapable. We're spending over a trillion dollars and growing just to service the debt every year. The, the U.S. with its de- debt and deficits as a percentage of GDP deficits as a percentage of GDP, at least, is the the greatest in the world today. It is a situation that is obvious. Uh, You know, you don't need much common sense to see that it's an issue right now. And it's a growing issue. Once you get into a debt spiral, it accelerates. You know, the water is circling around very quickly around the, the drain right now. So, yeah, I think that's going to overshadow things at some point. I do agree that Trump will help to revitalize the economy. I think the impact of greater tariffs, if he's able to implement that to a degree that matches his pre-election rhetoric, that remains to be seen. But that will have a different kind of effect on the economy. It will be a, have a dampening effect, at least initially. But uh, I, I think the U.S. economy is incredibly dynamic. You have to really work to screw things up. I think that the government policies over the Biden administration have been working very hard to screw that up. And still we've had economic growth. So it's incredibly dynamic. And I do think we're going to have a resurgence in economic growth. But the debt and deficits are still going to grow. And that is an issue that, again, is only going to accelerate in the years, months and years just ahead. Well, Brian, how do you see that playing into the strength of the U.S. dollars or a bid for U.S. treasuries? Because yesterday the dollar rallied, it got up to 105. That was definitely a pressure cooker on the commodities. I think a lot of the sell-off in gold and silver and other metals was a counterbalance to the dollar. Today it's down the dollar and everything's rebounding. So there's definitely that inverse correlation coming back into play here. But if there is such a big debt problem, Could it be a loss of faith in the U.S. dollar at one point, as we've heard for so long? Are we finally at that point? When you see the BRICS nations trying to mobilize and come up with some kind of cross-border trading system, are we at a point where the dollar could finally hit that structural downtrend where it stays in the downtrend? Or how are you looking at the greenback? Yeah, I'm really cynical about the whole BRICS thing. Uh, The only way those groups of countries are going to trust themselves is if they involve gold in some way. And I think that's they're not quite ready to take that step yet. What's really interesting to me is that we have seen develop a kind of a safe haven trade and that we're seeing yields rise, treasury yields rise, which is you know antithetical to the typical kind of a safe haven trade. You should see yields falling as people rush to the safety of, of U.S. treasuries. So that's kind of weird. But we have gold rising and the dollar rising, which are typical safe haven trades. I think what we've seen here is that the rising treasury yields are evidence of investors having some concern over the ability of the U.S. to service that great debt load. And that is the issue that is reflected by investors buying gold in the dollar. Now, if the concern was primarily about inflation, you would not see the dollar strength that we're seeing right now. So I believe it's a sign that markets 
and investors around the world have some concern about the ability of the U.S. to service the debt, and they're hedging against financial, really global financial turmoil as a result. And when investors around the world are concerned about global financial turmoil, they rush to the safety of the dollar and I think increasingly to gold. That seems to me to be the signals that the markets are delivering right now. Brian, let's dive down into the gold stocks then, because the gold stocks have been doing pretty well. We've had a couple weeks of weakness here, but you look at uh, many gold charts, gold stock charts, and they're trending higher highs, higher lows. We've had a lot of earnings come in from the majors just this week, and it's a a continued mixed bag. These companies are making money, but some of them are still missing analyst expectations when you see that money filter down into some of the juniors, like we did earlier on in October, what's your takeaway from the stage that we are in terms of, look, it's a bull market for gold. These stocks have been doing well. You can make an argument it's a bull market for the stocks, but how stable of a bull market is it in your eyes? Well, the stability will come from the consistency of the gold bull market. Gold drives everything. It will drive the silver market. Eventually, the rising gold market will drive interest in other metals and other sectors related to resources. It's going to happen, I think, as it always has, in that gold moves, then the mining stocks move, then the generals start looking for more torque, so they work their way down the food chain into the juniors. As you say, we've started to see that in recent weeks. And the juniors, and it's not going to be a a straight up rise or incline. There will be wiggles in the uptrend line. There there will be setbacks here and there. Uh, But we're starting to see that. You know, anecdotally, we're seeing more financings. We're seeing more financings at better terms and in being upsized. So it's starting to happen now. We're seeing the turn has happened and it's starting to grow. After all we've been through, it's, you know, it's hard to recommend more patience, but because we've been pretty damn patient, but I think we're just going to need a little bit more. And, you know, what we saw yesterday, in my opinion, was that the, the window of opportunity just reopened for a very brief period. And I think it was coming very close to closing over the, past, the few days before the election. Well, Brian, uh, another thing that people point to with the Trump administration is less regulation, less red tape. Do you think that affects any U.S.-based extractive industries, whether it's gold or silver or copper or even oil and gas? Do you think that less regulation means easier permitting or uh, any premium to be paid to U.S.-based companies? Yeah, I think it absolutely does really across the board. You know, this administration is going to be more pro-uranium. But I think that big shift in uranium already happened and that it went from something that was anti-green to pro-green over the last really, you know, four to six months. So I think that kind of already happened. We saw, you know, we have a great analog. We have the first Trump term. We saw it at, at that point in time, he had a deadline for permitting of two years. I think we're going to have that again, obviously. And I think uh, Companies need to take advantage of that, move really quickly to take advantage of that, because we're going to have midterms in a couple of years, and typically we see a big shift happen. But right now, with both houses of Congress and the White House, they can do a lot, and companies and investors really need to make hay while the sun is shining. I think it does herald a much better environment for resource companies and extractive industries and we're going to see money start to flow into those areas. Do you think we'll see a cheaper cost of capital for these companies too? Well, the cost of permitting is a big cost of capital, of of CapEx at least, if not OpEx. So yeah, I think we will. I think the future for oil prices is probably, you know, we're not going to have a big rise in energy prices, and that certainly helps mining companies from every aspect from OPEX to CAPEX. So yeah, I I think that will affect it a bit. On the inflation front, you know, you have the tariff situation. So I I don't know that's going to be helpful uh, to construction costs. We'll have to see. And and generally speaking, though, I think it'll be much better for mining and resource industries in general. 
All right, Brian, we're going to wrap it up here. But just as a reminder, the New Orleans Investment Conference coming up November 20th to 23rd. Click that link in the show notes to join Brian, join us and all the speakers and companies that he has attending this year. It is the 50th anniversary. I've been going for over a decade now, and I always take a lot away from that conference and visiting New Orleans this time of the year is also very enjoyable. So please, everyone, click that link in the show notes and I hope to see you all down there. Send Chad and I a note if you will be in attendance. Again, Brian London, editor of the Gold Newsletter and our host down at the New Orleans Investment Conference. Brian, thanks for your time and we will see you soon down in New Orleans. Thanks, guys. Great to be with you as always.